If you have a tough day at work and you get in the car and your first person you're going to call is your mom, not your wife, that's a problem. That's going to prevent you from the second half of Genesis 2.24, the two becoming one. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. Here at Focus on the Family, we love marriage, and I hope people feel that and know it. Uh, It's foundational uh, to the family, and it's a gift from God, and we need to lift marriage up to its proper place, and I think in many ways restore uh, what God intended with marriage. In fact, um, it's the reason why we talk so much about it here on our program. We like to equip you with those tools to help you live your marriage in such a way that others are going to see something wonderful and beautiful in your marriage. It's, it's a witness to the world. Today, we're targeting newly married couples, but this also applies to their parents. That's the good news. We're all going to benefit from the discussion today. Uh, we've got some solid, trusted advice about the importance of God's design to leave behind your childhood family and cleave to your spouse. So we're putting this in the family formation category, and we have invited one of the best speakers and authors on the topic of marriage, and that's uh, Pastor Ted Cunningham. He's the founding pastor of Woodland Hills Family Church in Branson, Missouri. And Ted, you've seen a few weddings, I think. Uh, Does one stick out like, uh (laughs) uh-oh? Oh, boy. I I remember one, I was in a wedding, and a guy passed out, one of the groomsmen, keeled over into the candelabra, which almost caught the uh, the drapes on fire. <laughs> I've had them from, they've, they've been so out of control crying, they can't say the words. That's to, sweet, though. That, that is. And, and you have to pause, you have to wait. I've had, uh, I've never had a bride or groom pass out, but I have had groomsmen. Yeah. Why is it always the groomsmen? Out. What are we doing wrong? And they're not even really are doing anything. Are they bored or right? they falling asleep or what's happening? They have one job. They have to stand there in a tux. That's it. That's your only job. If you can't make that happen, uh, we, we pick the wrong guy. Now, Ted, you are a contributor to a compilation a book that we worked on. Actually, it's a series of things, uh, DVD curriculum and other things, Ready to Wed. And I think Greg Smalley, who kind of orchestrated that resource and the other attached resources, saw that if a couple receives uh, 10 hours of counseling or more, their risk of divorce is significantly reduced. Um, you're a pastor. You're counseling couples who are thinking of getting married. Do you see that play out in your own in your own church? Oh, absolutely. We it's a requirement for us. If if you are wanting to get married, you know, at our church or by someone from our church, uh, we we require a minimum of six hours. Uh, believing 10, 12 is better. But our goal is that you don't just go through premarital. You, after you, <laughs> you get married, you plug into biblical community through a small group. You keep growing. Group. Yeah. Yeah. And continue to grow. I can remember when Gene and I did our premarital counseling in Southern California. I remember there were probably a dozen couples involved. And it was a all day Saturday uh, for two or three Saturdays. On the second or third Saturday that we were doing this, I remember three couples got up and said, we're not ready and we may not be right for each other, which is a mark of success, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think for, for Amy and I, we we went through a lot of skills-based premarital. And what I loved about Ready to Wed, and, and it's Greg and Aaron Smalley's heart and passion for marriage, is more at the heart level. We never really got into the heart conversations and the family of origin issues and the messages written on the heart. We were dealing with budgeting and dealing with, you know, the first night of intimacy. And anyway, we were going through more of the skills and not so much the voices or the messages written on the heart. Which is what really crops up in the marriage pretty quickly. Um, You may not see it in that honeymoon period, the first uh, maybe a year or two, but those things will eventually begin to pop their heads up like groundhogs, right? Yeah, and it's... it's, (laughs) Whack-a-mole. It's that that moment. You're you're trying to figure out why your, your spouse says or does the things they do, and then you're over at your in-law's house, and your mother-in-law <laughs> and your father-in-law says or does something, and you have that moment where you're like, huh, that's it right there. <laughs> you see that's it in it. live action. I just saw it. Now I know where it comes from. Now, being a guy, the one thing not to say in that moment is, honey, you remind me of yeah. your mother. Oh, you never do it. You never do it. <laughs> That's not good advice. Uh, what would Amy say, your wife, about good things a woman shouldn't say about her husband? 
Yeah, Amy, when she is, she's seeing more and more of my dad coming out in me, and and, <laughs> and there's a lot. I get my, my the mom that comes out in me. My mom gets excited very easy. I get excited very easy when things are happening, and and I love to tell you know my family to calm down. Hey, hey, everybody, calm down, calm down. Because <laughs> that's a good coming. place. Yeah, because we're at a good. And Amy reminds me, we are calm. We are all calm in this room, Ted, right now. But you, but <laughs> we uh, we see we see. Uh, uh, we love now seeing, you know, after being married for 20 years, uh, how much the family of origin still plays into oh, isn't it. isn't it? Yeah. Because... And the older you get, the more obvious it gets, well, I think. Well, and the I don't know. older you get, the more I appreciate it. Yeah. Probably five, five, ten years ago even, I'm seeing my mom and dad come out of me. I'm like, oh, but now I'm, as they're getting older even, I'm saying... Those are the qualities I'm I'm wanting. Well, and that was the section that you contributed in yeah. Ready to Wed, which was the leave and cleave. Now that almost sounds very Christianese, yeah. and uh, it would be good for people that don't even understand what we're talking about. What is leave and cleave? Yeah, Genesis two twenty four says, "For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two become one flesh." Most of the time, we look at that verse as a marriage verse, but the first half of that verse is parenting. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. In other words, it's the job of a parent to make sure a child leaves home as an adult, not on a journey to become one. That's the most important thing. Biggest mistake I think we make as parents today is we treat our children like children right up until the very moment we expect them to be an adult. Wow. And so for for me, it's not academics, it's not athletics that raise our children into adults, it's parents. And it doesn't say for this reason a child leaves his mom and dad. It doesn't say for this reason an adolescent leaves his mom and dad. It says an adult. Wow, think about that. My, I'm supposed to send my children out of the home, not on a journey to become an adult, but as an adult, prepared for the responsibility of work and relationships. And in the context of Genesis 2.24, cleaving. I, I'm supposed to be preparing my son at 11 years old right now to be a husband and my daughter at 13, soon 14, to be a wife. That's my responsibility, and that's where we get into the whole leave and cleave. I am preparing my children to leave. If you ask my 11-year-old, what's your dad's definition of Genesis 2.24, <laughs> he will look at you and go, I will not be with mom and dad forever, so plan accordingly. That's right. And I tell my kids all the time, we love you, you're a welcome addition to this home, but your mom and I, we got big plans after you leave. It's not my job to send Corinne and Carson out of the home for 10 years of self-discovery and to figure out who they are. I'm supposed to send them out prepared with the the milestones of adulthood, ready to go for work and relationships. What are some of those things you're doing, both for your daughter and for your son? So if the definition of prolonged adolescence is too much privilege, not enough responsibility, it's it's time as I move them into the teenage years to help them understand privilege is at the end of responsibility. You have to start laying on more of the responsibility. You have to start allowing them to make more decisions. If it's true, we treat our children like children right up until the very day we expect them to be adults. This is why so many young people crash and burn their freshman year of college. They're just not ready for the responsibility of all that freedom. Like my mom and dad were on me, some of them say. They were on me all the way up until they dropped me off at college, and then they weren't there to be on me. And so I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for it. Ideas were thrown at me, and events were thrown at me, and activities were thrown at me, and I just said yes to all of them. And so I think that starts way back earlier at that tween stage when individualization and separation kick in, and your child, according to the Scripture, is actually becoming a little adult that we, we have to stop seeing the tween years as this pushback period of time where they're rebelling. It's not, it's not automatic rebelling. It's they're becoming adults. Right. And how to embrace that and encourage it, but do it in a responsible way. Encourage it. On their it. part. I even use the word celebrate it. Right. Promote it. Right. Like, yay, you're an adult. So what that means is I don't tell you to brush your teeth anymore. That's not my <laughs> job. Right? That's like responsibility number one. I'm not going to be telling a 13-year-old it's time to take a shower, okay? And I but don't. But what do you do you. if they're not doing it? They're going to experience. Someone else is going to tell them. Well, I'll say this: someone <laughs> well, else is going to smell them. Right? That's and pretty say, true. Yeah, yeah, you need to take a shower. And I'm just saying, the loving thing to do as a parent is let me help my child understand that, yeah, and their need for it, rather than 
them getting picked on in the world saying, man, what do you, what's going on? That's your responsibility. You gotta, you gotta get yourself up. You gotta brush your own teeth. You gotta take a shower. You gotta get dressed. I'm not laying out your clothes anymore. You can tell I'm getting pretty worked well, up. Well, no, I pretty much, I'm just I, back. I mean, it's the season I'm back of back life I'm in. Brushing your teeth and taking a shower. <laughs> if you're not doing those two things, you're probably not going to be married. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. And that shouldn't yeah. start when they're, they're 18. I just think my parents it would never be my alarm clock at 16, 17 years old. It just didn't happen. I mean, I just remember they're like, you want to get to school, get yourself up. Now, my parents left for work before I went to school. So I, you had I had to do it. I, it was a responsibility thrust on me. And Ted, you talk in the book about um, your favorite moment in the marriage ceremony, and that's yeah. when dad gives away his little girl. And why is that particular moment as a pastor so rewarding for you? It's rewarding, it's emotional. You know, the guy can be, the dad can be 6'8. 280. <laughs> Let's and a hope so. Linebacker. <laughs> when, because I ask at the rehearsal, hey, tomorrow I want you to turn and face your daughter. Well, after I ask who gives this woman to be married to this man, we're not rushing through this. I want this to be a moment. And I don't, don't work to make this some viral moment on YouTube. This is you, dad and daughter. And I want you to speak a blessing over your daughter. You won't have a clock, so take your time. You wow. won't have a microphone. We don't need to hear it. We don't need to get it all recorded. Let this be your moment where you, th- I can't think of anything that's more literal for Genesis 2.24. Speaking life into your daughter. Yeah, this is, I am literally giving you away right now to be another man's wife. And dad at the rehearsal usually shrugs me off like, yeah, no problem. I'll do that, pastor. And well, I'm like, me, you me, have no idea. Yeah, let me ask you <laughs> why. Um, you know, I think today, I don't know if it's technology and entertainment and everything else, we we kind of shrug through this amazing moment of responsibility, and we underplay it in so many ways. When this is an astonishing moment, and and for me, I think big picture with weddings, I'm super sad that everybody wants them short today. Is is what I'm seeing in the right. church there, and and I will have the bride tell me keep it short. I and I, I used to sit down with couples and be like, okay, let's at my part, let me tell you what the, the elements that I'm over and then you let me know the special music if any family's reading scripture and there are no special elements. There's no extra they just this, want to get extra right that. To just it get right to it. Let's get this going. Let's get, get to the party and I'm going this is a lot of money to invest in 15 minutes. <laughs> right. But let's, why do you think that is? Why do you think people aren't cherishing this moment and how does that play downstream? With their commitment to Yeah, each other. that's a great example. And, and I know we say invest more in the marriage than you do in the wedding. But I think when we say that, we're not meaning, you know, don't don't view this as special. Don't view this right. as an opportunity or just a formality. And so, you know, when that dad on the wedding day after the rehearsal walks his daughter down the aisle and he turns to face his daughter, there's not a dry eye in the place. And, mm. you know, he doesn't have a microphone, so all we hear is, <laughs> I mean, just this little whimpering coming out. But we all have to take a moment to gather ourselves, and then he turns and faces him. And I've told my daughter, this is the story I use in the book, The Princess and the Queen. You know, when she was five, she was kind of taking over the home. And I sat her down and said, there's only one queen in this house, and you ain't her. <laughs> and she looked at me with those eyes that said, we'll see. Right? Oh, man. Yeah. And she's five. And she's five. And she told Amy the next day, there's room enough in this house for two queens. <laughs> And I sat her down. I said, listen, one day a little boy is going to say the words to you, I love you. And and I want you to know he's of his father, the devil, and a child of darkness. I want you to stay away. No, I did not. <laughs> Make sure healthy. every listener knows I did not say that to her. What did you say? I said, one day I'm going to stand at the back of a church with you, looking down the aisle, and I want you to understand something at that moment. It, I want you to remember what I'm saying to you now. What I'm going to say to you is you're growing up. Your mom is my queen. You will never be my queen, but you're my princess. And so one day I'm going to walk you down the aisle to become another man's queen. And I said, between this day and that day, I'm going to do the best Hmm. I can. To the best of my ability, I want to show you every day how a queen should be treated. That is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope every father is hearing what you're saying right now. And to cherish that moment to uh, wherever you're at, if your little daughter's 15 now or five, pick up that purpose today. Yeah. And, and on a first date, yeah, share that story. Hey, uh, this is my princess you're taking out right now. You had a story in this chapter in Ready to Wed 
which is a great curriculum, by the way. And this is aimed at churches primarily, but couples can do it on their own. But yeah. we would love for churches to pick this up and and again, to help those couples in your congregation have the best chance at having a lifelong commitment to their marriage, this kind of premarital counseling is what it's all about. But you had a story in there about a dad who was at the moment and decided he didn't want to give his little girl away. Well, he wouldn't answer me. I mean, that, that what happened? Yeah, he goes, I go, who gives this woman to be married to this man? It's what almost every pastor says <laughs> in some variation. And he was silent. And I thought, I tapped on the mic. This isn't like, rehearsal. Yeah, this is the wedding day. <laughs> and what's funny is we practiced it the day before, so I don't know what happened. I asked a second time, and he just stared at me. And I thought, okay, he's verklempt. He's, he's caught up in the moment. Let's give him a moment, because I think one of the worst things a pastor can do is step on moments like that. Just yeah. let those moments go. And But the third time I asked him, he said, I go, who gives this woman to be married to this man? He responded with, I will not give her. And I went... What? <laughs> so now this is getting a little uh, yeah. chilly. He said, but I will share her. Oh, man. And I looked over at the groom, and I said, I'm sorry, but the wedding is over. And, you know, he's got this look in his eyes, like, what, what is going on? How are we going to manage that? I just paused for a minute. And, you know, me, my big thing is I step on everything with humor. So I tried to make a joke out of it. But, I mean, the implication of sure. that statement for the next 10 to 20 years is what I wanted to address. I, I I had to hear, you know that moment when you're sitting in the exit row and are you willing and able to perform the duties of the exit row? You can't nod. Right. They, res- they require that you say out loud and audible, yes. Right. And I have to hear that from the dad. I go, because I when a mom comes up to me at a wedding and says, I don't feel like I'm losing a daughter today. I feel like I'm gaining a son. I tell her the same thing every time. Nope, you're losing a daughter. <laughs> It's time for you to back away. Well, that, that's it, the leaving part. When you think part. about it, that's completely right and logical. But you also understand the heart of the mom yeah, who, who wants who's to Who's going to be writing it. in after right. this. Uh, <laughs> right. But <laughs> how, I can't leave everybody hanging. How, how did you address he, that with the at, dad? I, I just, I, I did make a joke. I made a light out of it. But then I said, I've got to get the audible. I have got to hear. Right there. Right there. And yes. did he finally say it? He said her mother and I. Yeah, he did okay. say her mother and I. But I wanted to go on to a long Did you follow sermon. up later, like after the ceremony, and say, let me talk you through a little bit of what was going on? Well, this may shock you, but it found its way into the message of the ceremony, uh, oh, okay. the difference between giving and sharing. <laughs> <laughs> you were that quick on it. Well, I had to be. I just yeah. am like, listen, you know, for you two to become one... Because I'm this specific with guys. Yeah. Listen, if you've called your mom every day to share the highs and lows of your day for the last two or three years after work, listen, you, you can't do that anymore. Part of leaving is this is now the new lady you come home to and share the highs and lows of your days with. Yeah. I had a mom come up to me through premarital counseling and through what's in this book and all the examples of le- the leaving part. We haven't even really talked about cleaving. The leaving part. And a mom came up to me at a wedding and said, how dare you tell a son not to love his mother? <laughs> and I went, well, first of all, would you ever hear that? I don't care what pastor. You would never hear that out of a pastor's mouth. I said, I never told your son that. Here's part of the problem. You weren't in that premarital session. I told your son, don't call you every day. He can't do that anymore. But she interpreted that as he's disconnected from me. He doesn't love me. And then you have to walk through all of that with, no, this is actually love. This isn't hate. But I need to um, press you on behalf of those moms that aren't, they're not seeing it that way. Tell me why, spiritually. Tell me why. I shouldn't expect the same relationship with my son, even if he has married, or my daughter if if she's married. Why can't I still have the same relationship? Oh, so here's what I tell couples. You need to separate uh, physically. So you need to move out if you're living with your mom and dad. If, you, if you're still in the basement with Star Wars bed sheets, we need you out of there, okay? It's time to get married. Uh, you need to separate financially. I hear couples all the time, I want my parents to take our relationship seriously and not treat us like children. Well, one way you can do that is don't call home for money anymore. Get a second job before you ask your parents to bail you out. So you're separating physically, financially, you're separating emotionally. The, the problem, if, if you have a tough day at work and you get in the car and your first person you're going to call is your mom, not your wife, that's a problem. That's going to prevent you from the second half of Genesis 2.24, the two becoming one. Yes. Listen, the the... the the very definition of Genesis 2.24, the picture we have is the bond between a husband and a wife is to be stronger than the bond between a parent and a child, period. 
It, it has to be separate. Then you're separating uh, emotionally, you're separating relationally. And, and I tell couples, if those don't work, if you can't separate physically and financially and emotionally, you and this one really gets me in trouble, you may need to separate geographically. Yeah, that'll help accomplish the others. It will. Yeah. You may not be able to live two miles from your parents if they're stopping by all the time, if they're wanting to catch up on your life. You know, daily. These are the these are the boundaries that need to go in place if you're going to truly leave. Because we're talking about leaving. We're not talking about just moving. We're mm. talking about leaving that relationship to start a brand new relationship, which is the cleaving part. You're listening to Focus on the Family. Today, our guest is Pastor Ted Cunningham, and we're talking about his contribution to the Ready to Wed curriculum and book produced by Focus on the Family under Greg and Aaron Smalley. Uh, they head up our marriage uh, effort here at Focus, and they're doing a great job. Um, Ted, let me ask you this. Some parents, and they probably would be called old-fashioned, they think having the family around them is a good thing. Sure. And having that high interaction is a good thing. Intergenerational living is something that more and more people are doing. Yeah. Um, Is that healthy or unhealthy? I mean, in some ways, are you describing a cultural norm of today that you leave and cleave, and you separate in every way. Whereas, man, the in the Old and New Testament, families typically live together in the same community and share duties and responsibilities. There was a big difference, though, between yeah what we've experienced historically and biblically and traditionally and what we're experiencing now. Then you left your mom and dad's home and you went right into your new home. Yeah, it was built during the pre-wedding time. And, and so mom and dad would carve out an acre on the far end of their property, and that's where you started your family. Well, now you're leaving mom and dad and maybe spending 5, 10, and in some cases 15 years on your own right? before you enter into a new home. So that part is very different, and you now have, you've built a relationship with your parent as an adult that didn't happen for most history and, and biblically speaking. So now you have a husband and wife who have adult relationships with mom and dad and mom and dad were the go-to. You know, if, if you needed something fixed at your apartment when you were 28, you called dad. Well, let me tell you, well, now you got a new guy. Whether he's handy or not, dad's not the first go-to phone call. Yeah. Again, if you if the goal is oneness and not enmeshment and, and having a family that's so tied together. And that's the common theme. That's what you're really saying that's is what the we're... two becoming one flesh. You yeah. have to cleave to each other. Let's move into that, the, the cleaving the, portion. The here. biblical definition of compatibility is specifically two becoming one. And it's the last half of the verse because you can't have it without the leaving part. If you don't leave well, you can't cleave well. If you if you aren't in a... Uh, have healthy boundaries with your parents emotionally, relationally, financially, it's going to be very difficult to figure out how we're going to do this together, just the two of us. Isn't it interesting that the Scripture, of course, written by the hand of God, when you think about it, the wisdom that is there, that there's nothing new under the sun, and that God himself would say, leave and cleave. He would use those very words in in Hebrew to describe what a man and a woman need to do to become that one flesh. It, to me, that's fascinating. There's well, and nothing if, new under the sun. And, and if we're sticking, you know, if we don't like the word leave, and a, and a mom or dad can think we're we're being too harsh with it, it actually the word actually means to forsake. Mm. That's I think that's even stronger than leave. You know, moving out is one thing; <laughs> packing up my stuff and going into another home down the street or in a, a neighboring city is another thing. But boy, to actually say this relationship is completely changed now. Where's that the other side of that boundary when a parent, maybe an elderly parent, let's say the couple's in their 40s or 50s, that sandwich generation, yeah. and mom's now living with you in the little apartment, basement, or whatever it might be, um, how can you manage that moment in a healthy biblical way? Yeah, I still think the priority of your marriage is what leads to that mm. honor, to know, hey, mom, we're glad you're here. You're a welcomed addition to our home. We're still a united front. You know, though, and and I, you know what I tell parents and grandparents again: this idea of advocating for your child's marriage means you advocate for their marriage, not just your child. I think that's an important piece there. Sometimes we we pick our child or we pick one spouse. Advocate for both. Understand the marriage is important. It's the the cornerstone in that family in that home. Support that, and I, and I think it's one of the on the topic of leaving and cleaving. 
And again, going back to this idea that every marriage is a duet in need of great backup singers. <laughs> one of the best ways for a parent to be a backup singer to their adult child's marriage is to advocate for the marriage, not just the child. And I know the tendency when that child calls wanting to go at the husband or call, go at the wife and, and begins making all the statements, the faster you can shut that down, the better. Yeah. Because uh, you, you need to say, I'm here for both of you, not just one of you. Those who are absent are protected here. <laughs> on this phone call and in this room. This has been really good, and I want to thank you for sharing um, your great wisdom with us. I mean, I think pastors like physicians, you have amazing insights because you're working with people, and you're seeing them at both their strong moments and their weakest moments. And we all can learn from those examples, and the stories that you've shared today um, touch me in a way that it really... Um, invigorates me to continue to fight for marriage in a positive way. Let me ask you one more question. Encourage that young couple who are preparing for marriage. They may even be a little scared because they don't know that they're going to be able to do it well and make it to the end. Um, why should they step away from their families and learn to rely <laughs> on each other? It's a scary moment. The safety yeah. net's gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too often in marriage ministry and preparing you for marriage, we talk about skills but don't forget about voices, and you need to you need to have voices in speaking into your marriage uh, that you need to turn way up because you know you have plenty of voices that you need to turn down or mute altogether <laughs> that are that are not encouraging this and they're saying why do you want to do this why do you want to why are you married to him why you why him why start now go live your life don't this is just going to weigh you down you need to find voices and I obviously as a pastor I'm going to tell you it's in the church find biblical community that you can have people regularly speaking into your marriage saying, you got this. Mm. Ted, it's been great having you here. Thank you for having me. Hey, I'm John Fuller, and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there, and be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.